Hello everyone and welcome. Oh wait, wrong channel. What's going on everybody? Greg Peters here with the Car Passion channel and today's topic is widebands. Now once an engine gets modified enough, it basically needs a wideband. But when it comes to people installing them at home on their own cars, there seem to be a lot of questions left on the table. So in today's video, I'm gonna tell you everything you need to know about installing a wideband system in your car. All right, before we jump into wideband oxygen sensors and how that whole system works, let's first get a quick understanding of how the stock system works with what's known as a narrowband oxygen sensor. And we'll also get familiar with some of the terms that I'll be using throughout this video. So the ECU has two different modes for fueling based on the situation. During what's called open loop, this is when the engine is under a high load or in high RPM, full throttle, attempting to pass a city bus if you're in a Miata, and during this mode, the ECU ignores the oxygen sensor. It just dumps a set amount of fuel based on the load and the RPM, and that information is just programmed into the tune. Now the closed loop mode is active during engine idling, cruising on the freeway, and during this mode, the oxygen sensor is sampling the fuel and air that's going through the exhaust. It's sending a signal to the ECU saying either too rich or too lean. If the engine is running too rich, which means it's getting too much fuel, the ECU will send a signal to the injector saying, hey, cut down the fuel a little bit. If the sensor says the engine is running too lean, which means it's not getting enough fuel, the ECU sends a signal to the injectors to say, add a little bit more fuel. And this happens very rapidly, and this is called closed loop. It's a feedback loop where the sensor is continuously providing a signal that's saying add, take away, add, take away, add, take away fuel. Now when I say rich versus lean, I'm referring to something called the air to fuel ratio or AFR. And it's simply a measurement of how much air versus how much fuel is traveling through the engine at a given time. So if you're running a 14 to one AFR, that means for every 14 pounds of air that travel through the engine, one pound of fuel has gone through with that air. And that's 14 pounds, like the weight of the air. Why is the AFR important? Well, I'll get to that in just a second. The last thing I wanna talk about with stock systems is what, what does it mean when we say a narrow band sensor and why are wide bands so much better? This is a graph of the voltage signal output of a narrow band and a wide band oxygen sensor. So let's take a look at the narrow band in blue. It can output between zero and one volts and the only place it has any resolution is right here between 14 to one and 15 to one AFR. So what you're looking at is a sensor that all it knows how to do is bounce the engine back and forth between 14 and 15 to one continuously. And that's exactly what it does in closed loop mode. And it does its job very well. It can stick an engine right between those two AFRs where all the fuel is being burned, it's running efficiently, it's not polluting very much. But what happens when we need to target a certain AFR that's outside of that range? A narrowband sensor simply doesn't, it just can't read it, it cannot see it. And that's where wide bands come in. On a turbocharged engine, you're gonna be targeting around 11 and a half to one AFR in boost. The problem with the narrowband sensor here is whether you're at 13 to one, 12 to one, 11 to one, 10 to one, that sensor is just gonna be putting out one volt the entire time. It doesn't know the difference between any of these numbers. However, a wideband sensor has infinite resolution between all of these AFRs. It's a zero to five volt signal and it can tell you exactly what the AFR is everywhere from super rich to super lean. It's all right if you're a little lost right now. We're gonna, we're gonna start making sense of all this stuff in just a second. Let's look at what a wideband system consists of. The main components of the system here are a wideband oxygen sensor, an AFR gauge, and a wideband controller. Now in pretty much all of the widebands people are buying today, the controller and the gauge are wrapped up into one unit. I'm talking about the Innovate MTXL, the AEM Yugo, and similar. That gauge that you're putting into your gauge pod, inside of that is the wideband sensor controller. They're not two separate units anymore like they used to be a long time ago. Or for you motorsports electronics guys, 
ME221, ME442, you've got a wideband controller inside your ECU, which is a pretty trick upgrade. So I've drawn this to uh, more closely resemble what you're most likely gonna be working with, like an AEM wideband or something. So you take your wideband and you give it 12 volts from the car and you ground it, and then you plug it into the sensor, and then you take the sensor and you plug it into the exhaust, and then you've got a gauge that reads out the accurate air to fuel ratio. So it's very simple to hook up a wideband and get it working, but the way that you put the sensor into the exhaust is where some of the confusion begins. You have what I call the non-integrated way, which is where you drive to the exhaust shop and you have them weld what's called a bung into your exhaust and you add this additional sensor. So now you have two sensors in the exhaust. One of them is just telling you your AFR. The other one is controlling the injectors. The stock ECU doesn't even know that you've added a second sensor. It's completely standing on its own. Now, of course, not everyone wants to go to the exhaust shop and spend $40 having someone weld a bung in their exhaust. And why would you if you didn't have to? Uh, so you might be asking, why don't you just install the wideband sensor in place of the stock sensor and hook it up to the stock ECU and forget about all this and it'll be all good, right? Not exactly. See, there's a little problem here. Let's just say wide bands only speak French and the stock ECU solamente habla espanol. It only speaks Spanish and they can't really communicate with each other at all. The stock ECU cannot understand a wideband signal. It will just ignore it and do whatever it wants with the fueling. It might run super rich, it might run super lean, but at the end of the day, it is not gonna run good. So you can't just put the sensor in and hook it up to the ECU, but there is a solution, and that solution is called narrowband emulation. So you've got your wideband sensor in the stock location, no welding required. You've got your gauge reading AFRs, but the poor stock ECU is now left with no signal and it needs a signal in order for the car to idle and cruise at the correct AFRs. But now most modern widebands have what's called a narrow band emulation and this is just another signal wire that comes from the wideband that tricks the ECU into thinking it still has a narrow band sensor. So even though the sensor is putting out this signal right here, the tricky little controller is sending this signal to the ECU and it's saying, oh yeah, just bounce me back and forth between 14 and 15 to one. Where a lot of people mess this up is different widebands do this a little bit differently. I know on the original Innovate MTXL, there were two different wires, brown and yellow. One was wideband signal and the other one was narrowband emulation. Now on the AEM Yugos, there's only one signal wire that goes to the ECU but on the back of the gauge, there's a tiny little switch. You need a tiny little flathead screwdriver and it's got different modes that you can set it to. And you need to tell it, are you putting out a wideband signal or a narrow band emulation? So this is my first major PSA of this video. If you've just installed a wideband system in a stock ECU car and all of a sudden the car is running way too rich or way too lean during idle. You have probably not hooked up the narrowband emulation correctly because if you do hook it up correctly, the car is going to idle and cruise completely as if it were stock. Let's look at why would you want to run a setup like this? You've got a gauge that tells you your AFR, but you have the stock ECU which is not tunable. So does it really do you any good? Uh, definitely can because let's look at someone who's running a turbocharged setup on a stock ECU. They're fudging the fuel system a little bit, running a little bit bigger injectors that the stock ECU can still handle, and possibly running an FMU or fuel management unit that's raising the fuel pressure with boost. And these are all things that the stock ECU can handle, but you are changing the fueling a lot, so you wanna know your AFR. And these things are adjustable as well. You can go you know, up to uh, around a 300 or maybe a 320cc injector from the stock. The stock ones are like 240 to 260, depending on what year your engine is. And you can also raise the fuel pressure in boost, and that's not gonna affect your idle or cruise at all. But if you're boosting, you have to know your AFR. It is so important to know how much fuel the motor's getting and making sure that you're staying safe and making good power. All right, let's move on to our next topic here, the standalone ECU. And now you speak of my language. 
is what the O2 sensor is saying to the ECU now that you've installed a standalone in the car because a standalone ECU can fully understand the signal that a wideband oxygen sensor is outputting. In fact, standalone ECUs actually require that there is a wideband, otherwise it's literally impossible to tune it. All right, so you've put your standalone in, you've taken your wideband and you've switched modes, so it's now outputting a wideband signal or you've switched wires depending on which wideband you have. Now, all that stuff can be found in the instructions, which are all available free online. Just search Innovate MTXL instructions. First result is gonna be a PDF with all the instructions in it. So anyways, you put your standalone in and now you've got full control over when the ECU goes into open and closed loop. Not only that, during closed loop, you're not restricted to just this bouncy boy 14, 15 to one business. You can actually target specific AFRs. So let's say you're cruising on the freeway and you wanna target 15.6 to one. You can put in the tune that you wanna target that AFR. Or if you had a narrow band sensor, can't target 15.6 to one. All it can target is 14, 15, 14, 15, 14, 15. That's all it's good for. Wide bands, big brain. Okay, now on to some juicy things. I'm talking about the problems people have when they're installing a wide band in their own car. And what makes me such an expert on that? Let's just say, no exaggeration, thousands of people have asked me these questions over the years. So number one, you install your wideband, you've got a standalone ECU, and you open your tuning software and there's no AFR at all. It just doesn't read anything. This is gonna be one of two common problems. Either you don't have the right pin selected in your tuning software, you actually have to go in the tuning software and tell the ECU where to look for the wideband signal. Input A, pin 13, it might be labeled different things, but it has to know where to look, otherwise it's not gonna receive that signal. Or you might have just wired it into the wrong pin to begin with. Uh, the other thing is, and this sounds dumb, but the pin physically might not be connected to the ECU, and you would say, Oh, well, I think I'd know if I forgot to put this wire in. I know on the Megascore specifically, on the options plug, the little pins are actually kind of hard to push in. They, when you get them all the way in, they click, and if you don't go quite all the way in, when you plug in that options plug, it'll push some of the pins back out. I have spent a long time tracking down that issue before just to find out that I didn't push the pin in far enough. So that's a possible issue there. Next thing is the wideband gauge and the tuning software read two different AFRs. Now this could be a couple of things as well. Number one, most tuning softwares are gonna let you select from a list of widebands and yours may or may not be on that list. But if it's not on that list, you can also do a custom wideband calibration and I will link a video I made on how to do that below. But before you do that, you also wanna make sure that the gauge itself is reading correctly. Now I know the AEM sensor and gauge setup, it does not require any calibration and the Innovate gauges do require what's called a fresh air calibration. And if you're using a different wideband other than those two, you definitely wanna consult the instructions because some of them do require calibration and if your AFR is off by three points, your tuning is out the window. So this, that's a very important thing is you gotta make sure your gauge is reading correctly. Then you can proceed to make sure your tuning software is reading correctly and it matches the gauge. The gauge is reading straight off the sensor. The tuning software is just taking the signal output by the gauge and if that calibration is off, then it's gonna throw your entire tune off because your AFRs are gonna be not matching. Another common problem is you get your whole wideband system installed, the car fires right up, it's idling perfect, but the gauge is reading its maximum lean value. And on some gauges, that's just gonna be like three or four dashes. And on some, it'll read like 20.9 or 22.4 to one or something like that. People hit me up and they're like, my car's idling 21 AFR. I just installed the wideband, what's up? It's not actually idling 21 to one. The engine can't physically idle at 21 to one AFR. Usually around 17, maybe 18, your idle is gonna start getting very unstable and doing crazy things. What's happening is you're getting a false reading. The engine itself might be idling at 14 or 15 or 12 to one AFR, but the gauge is reading 20 to one. Look at these beautiful headers that I drew. All right, so you've got your oxygen sensor. That's this thing right here. And 
The engine is just sitting idling and the oxygen sensor is measuring the amount of oxygen that's in the exhaust. But let's say you have a broken exhaust gasket right here or your exhaust gasket between the header and the cat bag. At idle specifically, it's gonna be sucking in fresh air, maybe through here maybe through here and that fresh air is going to be hitting the sensor and then the sensor is going to see a ton of air in the system and say oh you're running super 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 lean now the engine itself is not actually running lean the sensor is just saying it is because it's getting this outside air hitting it and if you were to have a gigantic hole in your muffler it wouldn't really matter this air is not going to go upstream like this you've got to have a pre o2 sensor exhaust leak or Alternatively, if you've got a hood dump or a rice pipe or whatever you want to call it that blows flames and does all kinds of uh, questionable things, the only place you've got room for an O2 sensor is right here. Well, guess what? When the car's idling, it's still sucking in random little pulses of fresh air from this rice pipe here and it's wafting the sensor with fresh air and this again is only going to affect you at idle and low load low cruising speed it's going to throw your afrs way off you're not going to be able to tune idle afr or anything like that now at full throttle there's going to be so much exhaust and flames and street cred shooting out of this pipe that the wideband sensor will actually get a good reading. It's no, not going to be able to suck in any fresh air in that condition. The only other main problem I can think of right now is if you are burning up or losing sensors, you want to make sure that you have good placement in the exhaust. You do not want to put the oxygen sensor anywhere on the bottom half of the exhaust, especially on the very bottom. I mean, this one's kind of obvious because if you hit a speed bump, you'll just rip your sensor out. The real reason you can't have this here is sometimes condensation will build up in the exhaust and that is very not good for the sensor. So you want to make sure you have it at least uh, 9 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 12 o'clock, anywhere in this range on the top of the exhaust so there's no condensation sitting on it. And you don't want to have your sensor too close to the engine or turbo to where it's overheating. If you do have it like right off the back of the turbo, you might have to invest in an oxygen sensor heat sink, which uh, obviously helps cool the sensor. You don't want to have it too far away from the engine where the sensor is having trouble staying warm. Usually somewhere in the downpipe or in the headers or right after the headers is perfect for 99% of cars. And you also don't want to preheat the sensor before you start your car. So if you turn your key to the on position, the oxygen sensor will start heating and it will get considerably hot. And then when you fire the car up, it's possibly going to blast some condensation on the sensor and it's going to shock it. You have a very hot sensor, you're blasting it with cold condensation and that's not good for the sensor. So that's all I have for you guys on wideband systems. If I missed anything, if you guys have any additional questions, drop them in the comments below. I'll do my best to get to them. Smash like if you learned something, subscribe if you are new, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace out. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. Massive shout out to Engineering Explained, the original king of whiteboard explanations. I love your stuff, man. And as for me, it is 140, I have DMs, probably about wide bands. It's 1.41 a.m. I have to get up for work at 6 a.m. I will catch you guys later. I have so much, I can't, I can't sleep. I have so much fun stuff that I wanna do for the channel. Okay, for reals this time, peace out.